Welcome everyone to our third community call on the Discord server. Today we will be joined by the Ethernaut, who have been five years developing apps on Ethereum, and most of you will know him because one of the most famous CTF on this space, the Ethernaut CTF. Welcome. You have to, yeah. Hey, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, thank everyone to for having me here. Um, I know that you guys are serious business because I've I've seen one of re your reports recently. Uh, whatever you're doing works. <laughs> so so yeah, it's it's really an honor to to be invited to speak here. So I I hope I can I don't know address any doubts or things you want to know uh, properly. Yeah, everyone is surprised about five years in, in this space. Can you introduce yourself a little bit and why and how do you start uh, developing in this area? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so. Basically, I've been a software developer for like 15 years. Um, um, I, I studied physics, uh, but never like followed that path, right? Um, I started fooling around with computers. I had a, an electronic music band, and I started doing visuals. So I very, very rapidly discovered that coding was awesome. Um, so... Then I, I, I discovered that coding was like my life, right? So I stopped doing music. Um, and the first thing I did in programming back in the day was um, 3D engines. Uh, I, I, was, I really was into uh, graphics, yeah, right? Uh, GPU acceleration and all that. Um, and then, yeah, I had like a, a few, I visited, I visited some other areas, like uh, I did a bit of mobile and then audio programming and then a quick pass through Web2. And then uh, in 2017, I, I discovered um, Ethereum and just fell down the rabbit hole. Um, back then, I was using, well, since 2015, I think I was using Bitcoin to, to get paid, right? Um, because basically, I am from Argentina, and as everyone knows, there's like uh, very strange monetary policies, right? Um, I wouldn't say a di dictatorship, but certainly a, a, there's a dictatorship component, <laughs> um, and it was really hard to get paid. That like it's it sounds amazing, but I couldn't get paid. Like it, it would. Uh, take months. Uh, they would take a big chunk of my salary. I was um, selling like um, freelancing services to other countries, right? And yeah, it was really impossible. So that's how I met uh, Bitcoin, and it was like a magical solution. So it took me a few, a couple of years to realize what I was uh, that it wasn't just a payments solution. Um, and when I did discover it, I, I just looked into Bitcoin, understood it, and then like, immediately looked into Ethereum, and then I just um, fell down the rabbit hole and like just got obsessed with learning. Uh, qu pretty quickly, I, I found uh, tutorials from Manu Arauz. I don't know if you, anyone of uh, you guys uh, know him. But he's like a legend in, in Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. He's not very active lately because he kind of like um, decided to stop for a while. Uh, but I just saw videos of him and I was like, no way. Like there's an Argentinian talking about Ethereum. Um, like what, what's the chance of this? Uh, and I, I actually wrote to him and I just begged him to, to teach me. And he was basically my mentor for, for, for a while. And then he hired me because he was uh, one of the founders of Open Sepulting at the time. Yeah, that's pretty much how I got in. 
Yeah, yeah I think a lot of people uh, join this space because starting as a freelancer in some countries, it's like being uh, in the used currency with inflation, a lot of that. This was like the the heaven, and yeah, I know that that a lot of people started with Bitcoin and that stuff uh, for working as freelancers. But yeah, it's it's very very interesting. How, however, do you say you started with uh, with Open Zeppelin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, after I. Sorry, uh, after I I reached out to Manu and he like um, gave me a few like mentoring sessions, then he asked me to to join the team. I did a little work test and then I started with them. I I I, I think I stayed with them for like two years. Two years before moving to to something else. Yeah. Yes. So your career in this space has been in synthetics, argon, open zeppelin. How how was that? trip with it... well it, it was uh, it was very natural I, I I changed from one to the other and like everyone was super okay with it I never like uh, ended up in a bad relationship because of changing um, it, it was always very welcoming right to to leave a team and go to another like there was always a like a personal reason that made sense like when, when I moved from Open Zeppelin to Aragon, I wanted to stop um, like working on general stuff like audits and tooling, right? I wanted to get involved with um, like a concrete product, uh, and everyone understood that. And then when I moved from Aragon to Synthetics, like I was seeing the DeFi phenomenon take off, right? Um, and I wanted to to fly low, as I um, I like to refer to it uh, in that phenomenon, like um, see things as they evolve. Like I wanted to be uh, working on something that um, actually has like really strong traction. And at the time, Aragon was a very inspiring and a, amazing uh, idea, but it wasn't flying low. It was just like still like 10 years in the future everything that was being uh done right yeah the, uh, one of the questions related to to what well, when you've been working with open zeppelin uh, that's when you launched the the ethernaut right the cdf yeah um it was like actually like the first month or something. Um, I was in like hardcore learning, learning phase, um, and I wanted to to set myself some challenge uh, that would um, force me to learn. Right. So that's yeah. I was playing uh, the Bandit or the Over the Wire games, CTF games, a lot at the time. If if you guys don't know it, uh, I think I should definitely put it in text somewhere because it's awesome. Um, and I just said, okay, what uh, could I build something similar for Ethereum? Uh, and then it was hard for me because I didn't know anything at the time, but it forced me to to really understand all the hacks that I was studying right at the time as an auditor, um, because I had to synthesize the the actual hack into into some like code that can run and reproduce the same attack right and it was fun and it, it received a lot of uh people li liked it a lot i think it, it was um cancun the the devcon at the time i think it was three or something uh and everyone, everyone was playing it and i couldn't believe it like, um it took me a while to to receive that kind of recognition in Ethereum again, so it was it was pretty pretty crazy. Yeah, what what background knowledge do you think that it's required to attempt the Ethernet CDF? Um, 
Well, uh, a bit of JavaScript, I guess. Um, and then you can learn Solidity as you go. So you, you, if you know a little bit of, of Solidity, you're fine. Um, even if you, know, you don't know Solidity or JavaScript, you can, as long as you have like basic uh, programming knowledge, you sh it should be okay. Like sh you should be guided through it. And then it's gonna force you to learn really quickly because you 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 have to understand uh, solidity. You have to understand a bit of JavaScript to interact with the interface. Um, and then yeah, you're gonna learn some things about the the EVM, right? Yeah, something uh, I just uh, I started to look into this past week was the Ethernet DAO. How, uh, what is exactly, and how how it works? Uh, well, I, I'd like to, if I had to put a short, I think I, I think it's a Dep to uh, Web two to Web three Dep converter, um, and with minimal infrastructure. Like we we try to to help people that are, that are trying to make the jump from Web two to Web three by uh, finding a mentor for them, right? And trying to get them involved, like professionally involved in the industry as fast as possible. The requirement that we have right now is that, that um, the mentees, right, are senior devs already. Like we can't teach you how to code, but if you know how to code, we can hook you up with someone that will just give you the, the Web3 plugin, let's say. Yeah, so now you're more dedicated to help people joining into this space. What what are the common blockers from, as you said, uh, the devs jumping from Web2 to Web3? Mm, okay, um, well, first, I'm not uh, fully dedicated to this, I'm just, trying to to dedicate more and more time the reality is that i'm very absorbed by synthetics at the time we're we're developing the b3 system and it's a completely new like um architecture let's say that we're inventing it's really cool by the way um and then we're, we are also, also build, building a governance system that we we're actually trying to to make it as a product so every protocol can use it. Um, so yeah, I'm right now I'm I don't like I have time to to mentor, like always be mentoring someone, but that's pretty much it. In the future I am looking forward to 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 be more full time on this. And regarding your second question, um, blockers or the the biggest difficulties people have to uh, coming from Dev2 to Dev3, to, to Web2 to Web3, uh, I would say, like technical difficulties, I don't see many. I could like come back to that, but I think the biggest problem or something that I've seen that has actually caused um, mentorships to not work is people that know too much. Uh, and are not willing to let go of some quote quote best practices um, because some things in, in in this space change a little bit right there's nuances uh, that change some practices and uh, you need to be like malleable like you need to uh, put things aside and just absorb everything that the mentor has to to give you and and you'll you'll do well but i found that people that are too like proud of what they know already and are too rigid uh to, to change some concepts they have trouble i don't know if that makes sense yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense a lot of people with with big knowledge sometimes they struggle learning new things because yeah they just can't uh, change his mindset right so yeah you worked a lot with solidity and 
Um, did you did you work with other smart contract language or are you just working with Solidity? Well, I fooled around with uh, Viber, I think a little bit, um, but not really. Like uh, I never done anything professionally with any other language. So I would say just Solidity. Yeah, now, for example, with a lot of projects uh, developing on Rust, I read some comments about the design of the Ethereum virtual machine and Solidity regarding security. What do you think about that? And do you think that other smart contract language can do better in that area? Um, well, I I think that any smart contract is going to have like uh, quote quote security problems. Um, is it worth like going formal, um, like doing everything in with a formal uh, languages like Cardano? I think um, I don't think so. Like to be honest, I think um, Ethereum, the way things are right now, even though they're not ideal, they're like in the sweet spot of uh, something that is effective and can iterate fast, right? Um, like one of the things you get used to when working in this space is um, to be practical, right? Because if you try to be perfect, um, nothing would happen, right? Um, things would take forever. Like this is a very, very hot space. It evolves very, very, very quickly. So I think other languages will also have these issues. And if you try to uh, get rid of them, uh, you, you'll end up with something that's academic, academic, right? And academic things move too slowly for what we need to solve right now. Um, that's regarding languages. Regarding EVM, I, I also don't think that the EVM is poorly designed. Uh, I, I have the same view for it. Like It's a practical thing. It's kind of weird, I, I know. Um, and also coding for it is kind of weird. Like You often find yourself doing weird things to, to, to code. Like uh, For example, you don't, you don't have generics in Solidity. Uh, and you have to, I don't know, uh, end up doing weird things like parsing and I don't know. Yeah, how a script the... is, it's also a mess sometimes and still one of the most used languages. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The same thing. Like, I think the key to answer this question is that sweet spot uh, between security and practicality, right? The, the advantage that Ethereum has right now is the amount of, uh, like, its strong community, the amount of developers and people just being practical, right? Uh, don't not being scared of making mistakes, right? Um, but as well, like, like moving quickly. Yeah, but one of the hardest part of this space is the code are moving money. So yeah, sometimes yeah. it's like hard. Yeah. The safety area well, it's a it, tricky part. Yeah, of course. Like that I think that that part is left to to the practices of the team and the individual, right? Um so anyone can jump in and and code Solidity and code JavaScript uh without having to learn like formal verification and weird uh Haskell stuff, right? Otherwise onboarding would take forever. Um but then it's up to you to be as safe as you can. Like for example, right now I'm I'm coding an election module for the Synthetics B3 governance system. I before I code any solidity, I code test, right? And I just code coded like a a array utility and I have like 120 tests for it. Right? So um the tooling can like the, the language and the tooling lets you be sloppy, but just know that if you're sloppy, you're gonna get hacked the shit out of you, right? So like the compromise right now is to to use these tools, but uh, use them as well as you can. 
And now if someone wants to join the team or, or the space, they can look at my code and they will understand it because it's just JavaScript, right? So I actually like that. Um, I think it's going to evolve. But for now, I think it's a good position to be in. So uh, another question regarding this, this area. Do you spend time hunting bugs on other smart contracts or just focusing on synthetics? Well, um, there's so many things to do in this space uh, that you have to choose, right? Um, so no, I, I'm not currently hunting bugs uh, because I'm focused on building, right? And what I'm building is complex enough that I don't have much time for other stuff. Maybe if I, if I didn't have two kids, <laughs> I will probably do two things. But now, now that I do have a family and like I have a real life to attend to, um, I have to choose basically uh, one thing and focus on that and do it really well. Like what I do is like stay informed on, on hacks, like see, see mistakes people have done and like make sure that I don't do the same mistakes, but I'm not like actively hunting bugs at the moment. Understood. So that's all I have prepared for the for the questions. I see a few more on the chat. So yeah, if you want, I can read it. Yeah, what's your opinion of Solidity versus Rust? Um, yeah, I think Solidity is pretty, um, it's, it's nice, but it has some, some disadvantages that make you like code around the pattern. Like, um, for example, one of the, the limitations it has is that, uh, contracts can have a certain, uh, size, right? And then you have to structure your, your code to over, to like, overcome that technical uh, limitation that the, the language gives you, right? You could argue that the limitation comes from the EVM, right? Uh, but the language, I think, should abstract that limitation and allow you to just be expressive, right? And you end up like the, the system that we are, um, the, the architecture that we're using for the Synthetics V3 right now, uh, it's just a big work around uh, the, the contract size limit stuff right uh which works it's very powerful but in the end by the end of the day you ask yourself uh like should i really be doing this or should the language do this for me right so that's the problem so it is nice it's fun it's useful effective but you encounter a lot of uh situations in which you're like uh, bumping your head like why is it like this, right? Why do I have to worry about this? Why can't the language solve this for me? Um, it's it's not ideal, but again, it it works, right? I think we we're approaching a, a a critical mass event where the tooling and the languages are just going to um, evolve to to the next level, right? Like a more like an industrial level and not so, such a so much uh, like an amateur level that we are now. Um, and I think by, by that time, we, we should have languages that, that let you be more expressive. Yeah, I totally agree with the, with, with the improvements of, of the languages. So I, another question, yeah. Since you're familiar with the with Ethereum for a long time, when Ethereum migrates to proof of stake, do you think the gas will come down? Um, I'm not sure. Like to be honest, I'm not following that um, part that part of the protocol development as much at the moment. Um, that's more of what I said a, a, a moment ago about having like choosing something in, in the space and just becoming really good at that. Uh, unless I don't know, you're 
very capable and you could do multiple. Um, one of the things I'm not following in terms of uh, technically is, is that, right? I am following like um, what the multi shard uh, part might look like because um, I had to implement a lot of things in layer twos. So I have an idea of how that's going to work, but I really don't uh, have an understanding of how the change of the consensus, consensus mechanism uh, is going to change um, gas costs. OK, perfect. Anyone have another question? Well, if anyone thinks about a question later, uh, you can reach out to me um, in Discord. Yeah, there is one on the chat. I'm not me. sure how how synthetics works, but it's about uh, synthetics uh, mimicking real world stocks that uh, he think it's not authentic. What? How how that works and Okay, so it's not just that Synthetics tries to mimic real world assets because um, these so-called synths uh, are not just of real world assets. You also have Synthetic ETH, right? Synthetics, uh, whatever, crypto coin, right? Uh, the thing about Synthetics is that it ha it's like Synthetics derivatives. Like you're exchanging things that don't really exist, but represent the underlying asset. So what you get with that is like um, infinite liquidity of the asset you're changing and allows you to perform certain like advanced uh, financial operations we ha without having to worry about how much is available in the market right now. Um, that's, it's more about that than just bridging real world assets into the uh, into on chain space right yeah understood someone else is writing i'm not sure yep nope <laughs> no one else writing well, you said they can reach you on the chat, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I don't know if um, you can find me. I'm Ale uh, Bar Synthetics uh, two nine nine one. Like that's my user, I guess. Uh, just reach out to me, and I'll try to help. Another question: Are there any plans to update the Ethernode CTF? Well, after I, I left uh, uh, Open Zeppelin, they asked me if, if I wanted to maintain the project, and I said no. Um, and they are maintaining it, so you would have to ask them. So far in the Ethernet, that we talked about um, um, developing other um, like CTF sort of games which would be very interesting in optimism right now. Um, but again, it's there's like nothing concrete right now being worked on. But I, I, I really do see that as a Ethernet B2. OK, thank you very much. So I think we can wrap it up. Thank you very much for for joining this call and helping to understand a little bit more about synthetics and your path in this space. And yeah, 
Oh, another question. Yep. How <laughs> how does it feel when the audit team finds vulnerabilities in your code, and how satisfactory do you feel? Mm, well, I, I, I like the the emotional involvement at that moment is pretty low. Uh, I, I can think of many higher uh, impact moments, like when when a live vulnerabilities found in production on your code that's yeah that that causes a reaction um and i guess i don't know you feel stupid um but then it quickly fades away because you're like very involved in like solving the issue right um i think the the most scary part is when you're deploying when you don't know if your code's gonna just uh, survive in the dark forest, um, that's the scary part. But then that's why you write hundreds of tests for everything. Uh, well, at least that's my style. There's other styles like testing prod and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, when when you do an audit and you get a report, that's fine. It's like, oh, good, someone broke my code. That's you actually want that because. If a white hat breaks your code, that's a, like a really good news. It means that it's someone's tried to break it and just found that. So it, it's actually a good news to find a, a vulnerability report before you go live. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you. And well, uh, oh, you as an auditor, what methodology do you prefer to perform an audit? Well, yeah, that's. Uh... Well, um, there's uh, I think two branches of method. Um, of um, ways to do it, and I like the the open Zeppelin way, which is like more uh, manual. Like we we didn't use a lot of tools that like um, systematically uh, study the code. We prefer to just become one with the code. Like uh, look at it so much that you see it in your dreams. Like you could like rewrite the code from your memory, right? Um, and that's like a process of uh, understanding it, coding it, some, recoding some parts, getting very, 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 very familiar with it. And then you start connecting the dots. But for example, Trail of Bits, uh, they have a, a, a methodology that's more of um, running a bunch of super sophisticated tools that they built on the code and then doing a bit of like manual analysis, but it's more based on tooling in open seven and the way i do it is like very very manual it's just you you versus the code yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much again i think no one else have any questions so i will be closing the space and stopping the recording Okay, thank you. Thank you.